Welcome to the Yogi MD Podcast. It's Nadine, yoga teacher, health coach, and retired doctor, here to bring you and your body together, not in sickness, but in health. Thanks for taking this time for yourself. It's not easy when people are going to tell you go back home or watch you. It's not easy. But I, I know things were not going to get better. I knew it. Because that, I see the decline of age. I knew because when Duvalier became president, I was 14 years old. So from that time until that I left in 19, uh, 1968, I experienced a lot of things about the age I knew prior to the Duvalier, even though I was young, was different because everybody is enjoying life. Everybody knows everybody. I learned my lesson to respect every human being. I never thought that I'm superior to X or Y. I have him to take. Who are you a unit? This is my parents' story. In 1968, after they were married, my dad left Haiti to start a new life in Chicago. My mother joined him a year later. They had a dream to have a family. Because of their sacrifices, they not only fulfilled their family responsibilities, but they made it possible for our family to thrive, not just survive. I want to thank my parents for this special opportunity to document an important story for us using this powerful platform I love, podcasting. And now I get to share it with you. What were the circumstances which compelled you to leave your country and come start a new life in Chicago? I was uh, 19 years old when I left Haiti to come to Chicago to join my husband, who was there a year earlier. But what was going on in Haiti? Why couldn't you stay there and start a family there? Growing up in Haiti under the dictatorship of Duvalier was terrible. Every aspect of life, of society, began to fall. Lack of opportunities, violation of all institutions. However, when the American embassy began recruiting any qualified person to come to the US with a permanent visa, apply, pass a test, and was accepted. Then I found a job opening in Chicago. What did it feel like when you were leaving? Oh my God, leaving my country was the hardest experience of my life. Since I was the first sibling to live on, I was the first one to live on. It was uh, five of us. I was the fourth one, like the baby, the baby sister. You know, very, it was hard. Hardest thing, painful. The transition was horrible, was even horrible. I was homesick a lot. But I realized that going back to Haiti was not an option. So I had to adjust to my new life in the US. You know, like adjust to the weather, the food, the language, and everything else. It was, the shock was real. The shock was definitely real.
what was it like when you were leaving your mom, your dad, and your siblings? What was that day like? That day, I never forget that. Couldn't eat, didn't sleep. When I left, my mother was in bed for a whole, I think they said two or three weeks. It was like a death in the family, really. And I remember clearly going to the plane. I mean, unbelievable crying and everything. Why Chicago? And why not New York? Because, you know, I applied for New York. My first, my, my application was to leave Haiti to go to New York. But the, the American embassy <coughs> sent me a, a, a letter to let me know there was any opening in, in New York so that when I switched to Chicago. So tell us what a day was like in Haiti with your family, because I'd like to contrast what that was like and then when you find yourself in the U.S. We were middle class in Haiti. You know, we, we had food. We, we were doing pretty good. Haiti was really a nice, good, con- good place to live in. Or you wake up, we had, we had maids. We didn't have to do much. We even have people to take us to school. So you go home and you know you go to school and you learn, you do your homework, then you eat. That's why it was so hard on me. Everybody, the, the whole village, everybody, they shelter me. And then uh, really thing we we do, we used to watch a lot of movies. We used to go to the movies a lot. That's the reason why I think that United States, what I saw in the movie, I thought everything was clean, everything was perfect. Because that's what they used to show you, glamour. But I can, we can tell in uh, the uh, Duvalier regime, regime, things was not going to get better. In Haiti, uh, people live, you know, people live like, it's, this is a fraternal country where everyone is, is care about the next person. So when I come here, you, you have to stand for yourself. That's one of the only thing, one of the experience that I, I, I acquired. So, in Haiti, uh, uh, my family, the family I've been raised is about seven of us. And then uh, I had experienced the time where we didn't have food on the table, we didn't have uh, a place to stay. I'm going to many schools in my grammar school. Uh, so uh, that, that taught me life. You know, that prepared me for any eventuality. Because coming from to a poor country and coming to a rich country, that's a big difference. You know, so this is, this is a, a long time experience for me and, and I enjoy it. So flash forward when you find yourself by yourself coming to the United States. You, you boarded the plane by yourself for the first time, right? I boarded the plane by myself, crying the whole time, crying, crying. When we landed, I don't know where we landed because of the, uh, there was another guy who said he was going to help me because I look helpless. So we stopped and missed the plane. Imagine the guy on his way and I was lost. I didn't know what to do. So I went somewhere and I went to a phone booth, not even knowing what the phone booth was. I went inside the phone booth. I couldn't get back out. I was trying to call my, uh, my husband. So when, after I finally got out, I went to the, it was Pan Am, the airline. 
I talked to the one of the lady. She speak French. So now I explain what happened to me. And they give me a hotel room. So I sleep there. And the next day, I let, they put me in a place where I end up in Chicago. Did you speak English well? Not at all. No English. Everything, all the movies, everything was in French. Then when you found yourself in Chicago for the first time, what was that transition like? Remo was waiting for me. So we went, we went to the, he had a place, everything ready for me. So we went there and then luckily his cousin was in Chicago. That's where we stayed. And they have uh, kids like my age. So we bonded. Can you tell us about the cultural shock that you experienced? A little bit more about it. What was the change like? What was the environment like in Chicago compared to what you described in Haiti? My first experience in U.S. was shocking. The assimilation of the English language, the fast pace of life. But after, after 52 years in this country, I did adjust to the, to the American culture, but still attached to my heritage, Asian heritage. That's why I'm an Haitian American. It was a faster pace. You know, it looked like everybody was running. The language, the weather. One of the shocking things was the weather because I come from an island. We only had one, one uh, <laughs> season. Uh-huh. But like I said, the, the, the cousin make it easier. They took me to the store. So it was exciting. You know, we didn't have a huge store. So what, when you say your Haitian heritage versus your American uh, culture, adopting American culture, what are some key differences? Haiti, you know, the, uh, that's a French, almost, the, the Haitian culture is just like a French, part of the French culture. So when I, uh, whatever we have, we have uh, the food, the music, the dance, the language are different. So it, it was a, a good experience for me to adjust myself to the new culture. And I can compare both cultures and from there I can, you know, I can uh, I can do the best and and uh, live a, a beautiful life because this is a plus to have to, to compare two cultures. What did you like about American culture? Uh, the American culture is a certain ways, it gives you a, 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 what they call a, a time and opportunity to, it's, it's like a dream for you, the American dream, because they give you opportunities, so it's up to you to make a choice. You know, there's work, there's uh, school, you know, many ways for you to, to, you know, to find, because uh, <laughs> you come in this country, I had a, a luggage, but now after so many years, after 50 years, 52 years, look what I, I have now. So working hard, a lot of dedication to, to what you want to accomplish. So I thank God, I thank God that, you know, I accomplished so much in this country, that the main thing, because the opportunity was open for me to, I expect those opportunities to come to, to this point in my life. What kind of work did you do when you came to Chicago? Uh, first, I worked in a, in a little factory from 1960, I, I used to do two jobs, working in my regular one, I worked seven days a week. 
working my regular work and work uh, as a part-time in a, in a filling station. So I spent two years doing that. And uh, in March of 1970, I found a good job at UPS. So I stayed, I stayed at UPS for 33 years. Can you describe when your grandmother came over from Haiti to live with you? So we were still in the, the cousin house. We live in an attic with a bedroom and all that nicely. That's when you were born there. So they have to move to New York, the cousin. They were living in Chicago. So we went to a new apartment. That's when my grandmother moved with me. Voluntarily, she moved with me to help me. So she babysit, and I was in peace when I was going to work. At that time, I was working. So going to work, you know, I, I was in peace, knowing that you were in good hands. And when we come home, when I come home, food is ready. She did all that for us until she got sick. Her request was she wanted to die in Haiti. So when she got sick, she went back to Haiti, and that's when she passed away. Then I said that we got to have our own home. So we work hard. We have a new home. That's when my mother took over. My mother lived with me for over 20-some years, doing the same as my grandmother was doing until she passed away. These two unselfish and loving women were my backbone. Did you ever talk to either one of them about why they decided to do that? I didn't have any relatives in Chicago. I was by myself in Chicago. And that's why they, they, they want to help. So I will eternally be grateful to them because, you know, they did it for me. You know, in America, one of the general jokes, kind of accepted jokes, is how difficult it is to get along with your in-laws. And here you are living with your wife's grandmother and then her mother. How was that experience for you? Oh, the, the most beautiful experience I made in my life. Because all, all the way, my, my background, my mother, I consider my mother... I consider like, you know, she is the one who gave me life. So I consider women as precious because living with the grandmother-in-law, the mother-in-law, that was great for me. And, you know, I don't know how to, I, I, I don't know how to explain my appreciation and my recognition for these two lovely Woman, because they, they, they help me in many ways in my life. So if I respect women anytime, and there will be, I know some people, they feel like uh, if they, have, they can live with grandmothers or, or mothers, anyone close to their, their wife, I didn't, I didn't experience any problem with them, paying them. One of the things about being Haitian is that there is a deep sense of respect for family values as well as being educated. And we can talk about those later, but can you talk to us a little bit more about the idea of family and what that means to you? My main goal in life was to create a family. So I work hard to provide for, for all my children, for my family, I should say. Uh, <laughs> family is, is, a, is special. Family is something that uh, you have to dedicate a lot of uh, sacrifices and discipline in, in, uh, toward that goal because when when you have a family, your life change, and I don't think there is anything 
you can accomplish in your life than having a family. Well, family means everything to me. When we, you and, when we were in Haiti, family, you respect your elders. I don't care if you were like 50 years old, 60 years old, you respect your elder. So I had great, great respect for my grandmother and my mother. Helping each other. And you all made sacrifices for each other too. Oh, the sacrifice, that's what they did for me. Uh, you know, they sacrificed the, the whole life to stay with me. How many people can I do that? That was unbelievable. And I didn't, I didn't ask. They want to do it because family, that's what family, that's what they do. That's what we do. It was not, you're going to pay me, I'm going to babysit. No. They live with you. They did everything they could for you. They stay with me to help me. I have three daughters. None of you ever know what a babysitter looks like. None of you. That's a blessing. When my mother passed away, the, I do the laundry and she fall. Till now, after 20 some years, I still do not like to fold clothes. <laughs> Because that's my mom used to do it. And she, and she did all the cooking, too. She did all the cooking. My sister and my grandmother did the same, all the cooking. When my mother died, I didn't know what to do in the kitchen. I was lost because I didn't have to cook. I never had to cook. What were you personally willing to sacrifice for your family? I sacrifice, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's not an excuse, but the type of work that I was doing, I worked for GE for 20 some years. I wanted to go to school, I want, but I want the best for my kids. I want them, I want them to have the better education. I want them to go see other places, other country explore the things. I know it's not an excuse, but I I rather do it for them than quit work and go to school. That's one of my regrets. But what I did not accomplish, I saw it through you guys. And I explained to you guys, I don't know if you remember, education was key to your success. And nobody can tell you what you can do, what you cannot do. So you did not disappoint me. You guys did not disappoint me. I have a doctor, I have a lawyer, and a professor. What else can I ask for? That was my reward. You guys are my reward. Why coming from a poor country do you think in coming to an affluent country like the United States, did you not think about make the most money as you possibly can? Why was that not one of your values? It actually, you know, this is the, uh, this is the foundation of my, my uh, education because learning that when my father was losing jobs and working, not working, this is a good experience to show you that uh, actually, and my, my parents always preaching us to, to go to school, to educate ourselves. And I, I'm not, to, to, to make it short, I need money, but I don't love money. That's my way of living. Because I think you can accomplish many things. The money is a second, second part of, uh, you know, you can say it like that. It's second in your lifetime because what is your purpose if your purpose is about material thing? It depends upon where you form, where you want to, where you want to go. You know? Because all those things that material that you acquire, you, you're going to leave them one day. 
we didn't you you didn't born you weren't born with anything in this world, and you're going to live the same way with uh, the way the perception I have of, of life give me opportunity to realize so many things, and at my age now I can s- s- lay down with peace. Well, let's talk about grandchildren now, because you've started to see your dreams become exponentially realized in the lives of your oldest granddaughters, Maddie and Lizette, my girls. You also did the same thing that your grandmother and your mother did. I never had to worry about my kids their welfare. I never had to worry about the amount of love that they would get. I never had to worry about what they would eat. You took care of my girls for me too. How did it feel to be such an integral part of your grandchildren's lives? (laughs) This, I want to express that because, uh, you know, I, I never expect never expected that I would reach a certain, a certain point of my life where I will have grandchildren. So when I, when I look at the way that my children raise their children, that's a great, great pleasure for me. That's a great accomplishment because we, we didn't work, Yannick and I didn't work in vain, you know? So to see Madi, go and finish college to see Lizette is going to, to the same pattern and to see the kids in, 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 in California, high school, both of them are in high school. That's good. That, that, that means that, again, you know, we, we help, we help your ch- our, our children to follow the same, same pattern that we introduce them to. I could not believe God gave me the opportunity to do the same when I retired to do the same for my grandkids. Those kids are the love of my life. I would do anything for them, anything. And they are starting to follow the parent footstep. And you know, beside, I always say beside, your parents, you and Kevin, I didn't think anybody else was going to take care of them beside me. No one. I know nobody else in the world could take care of them like I did. Oh, that's, that's absolutely true. <laughs> and so now, how does it feel to see these girls in college, finished college and in the midst of college? I am so proud of them. I'm telling you, I am so proud of, so, so, uh, proud of them. This is what I always want. That was always my dream. And I cannot forget my grand dogs either. I got to <laughs> I gotta talk about my grand dogs too. <laughs> you even took care of your grand dogs. That's yes. how dedicated you've been. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have any regrets? No regrets, really. Things are, things, life is not easy. Things happen in life. I am blessed with a husband, a loving husband, 52 years, four, three amazing daughters, four loving, adorable grandkids. What else I need? I cannot have everything. I was not perfect. I'm not a perfect mom. But I did my best as a young immigrant woman. I have to give a shout out to that young little immigrant girl. Job well done. So, Mom, before I ask you my final question, you had a significant health scare many, many years ago with cancer. And so I'm sure as a cancer survivor, your 
vision of what it means to be a healthy person is different than someone who didn't undergo such trials and tribulations. So what can you say about what you define as being healthy? I have to stay physically and mentally active. So I walk five days a week. During the winter, I go to the gym. Mentally, I like to read. I read a lot. I did yoga, yoga over, over 10 years. Oh, it's been a long time. Yeah, well over 10 years. I love gardening. I do garden. And every night before I go to sleep, I do a puzzle. I'm always active. And try to eat right. That's all I can do. Keep up with my health. And I got to thank you for my health too when I was sick. When you gave me my first grandchild, Maddie. I think God may put me in this world to do something for a purpose. For a purpose. Having a grandkid is a special love. It's, it's not like your kid is a special love. I never fought so hard in my life to stay alive for many. You guys too, but for many. I used to take that girl with me every appointment. All the nurses, everybody knew Mary. And you know, I never complained. With all the pain, everything, I never complained. I say, I'm going to fight. And I fought hard. Thank God, it's been 20, 20, maybe it's 22, Mm -hmm. 23 years. Mm -hmm. Cancer free for now. Thank you, Mom, for sharing your story with everybody. You're welcome. And I love you. I love you too, Mom. To me, be, being healthy is an individual choice. I used to play soccer in my, in my young age in Haiti. Therefore, I established a set of activities. Walking two hours for five days in a week. Cutting my grass, drinking plenty of water, and finally reading my newspaper daily. Uh, In general, I like to thank all of you. The children, first of all, my, my dear health, and the, the children, the grandchildren, for giving me the great, great, great experiences in my life because your success is my success. Well, I want to thank both of you for everything you've done for me, for my girls, for my sisters, for my niece and nephew. You're welcome. And now it's time for the Mindful Minute. James Baldwin said, Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. So my dear listeners, I ask you, will you choose to learn your story from your family's elders? And what is the legacy you wish to leave behind for the next generation? Haiti is my soul. United States is my mind. We are Haitian American. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. And are you interested in starting or maintaining a yoga practice at home? I teach yoga to wise women. I believe in empowering and educating wise women to thrive on their terms at every stage of life. Let's hear what a wise woman has to say. You're touching lives. You are much appreciated for that. 
What you do is more than teach a yoga class. To learn more, connect with me at yogimd.net. And finally, podcast theme music is by my niece, Maya Bishop, on vocals, my daughter, Lizzie Kelly, on guitar and bass, yours truly on percussion, and produced by Tim Buell. Thanks for being here. See you next time.